when um, my first exposure to the literacy campaign for Monterey County was working on a grant application um, to help get the city of Salinas into the national campaign for grade level reading. And my predecessor, uh, Marcy Rustad, is here. And she was the one who was foundational and pushed this thing forward and got us involved at a national level. And I want to thank her for that. And on that national level, we have a couple of people here with us today. Um, Mr. Ralph Smith is the senior vice president of the Annie Casey Foundation. And he's also the managing director of the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading. And with him is Alicia Maldonado. Uh, Alicia is the California lead for the national campaign. And she's also president of Mockingbird uh, Communications out of Los Angeles. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please help me in welcoming Ralph Smith and Alicia Maldonado. Good morning. Well, that tells me. Everybody, just stand up and stretch for a second. Stand up and stretch. Stand up and stretch. <laughs> Come on. Good, good, good. Let's, I, I saw somebody getting their hands up up there. That somebody was actually dancing. <laughs> Come on. All right. Thank you, thank you. Good morning again. Now we're going. Uh, let me uh, just uh, say, Ron, I'm uh, delighted to be here. This has really been an in inspiring uh, morning. Uh, I get a chance to go to a lot of places across the country. Um, very few places have this kind of turnout. Uh, and very few places have this particularly special history. And you're packing a lot into a very short period of time. And I know that the organizers of this event want to make this a commitment event. So what I think I can contribute is just giving you an overview of this national effort that we're attempting here, which is really a response to a call to action and a call to action. In 2010, the Annie E. Casey Foundation published a report entitled Early Warning. And in early warning, we noted that third grade reading, which is an important and critical milestone and predictor for high school graduation, had become a catastrophe in the making, especially for low-income kids, that 80% of low-income kids were not reading on grade level by the time they left third grade. We thought something needed to be done about that, and we published a report of, uh, issuing a call to action and decided if we were going to issue the call, we should be among the first to answer. And so we, along with a number of philanthropic partners, launched uh, this campaign. And what we said at the time, and what we still believe, is that we're not going to make a dent in intergenerational poverty unless three things happen. And these three things were not the Casey Foundation. It's Ron Haskins and Bell Sawhill uh, condensing all the research and to say, look, if we're going to disrupt intergenerational poverty, we've got to get kids to graduate from high school. We've got to help them get and hold on to a job, and we've got to make sure that uh, they de de delay pregnancy, childbirth, and parenting until they're 25 years old or married. Now, you might expect that the third of those could lead to significant debate, and has. The second of those will raise a few eyebrows given the state of the economy. But for most low-income kids, the issue isn't pregnancy and childbirth, and it's not getting and keeping a job. It is really graduating from high school. Because for the lowest income kids, 
in communities across the country, urban and rural, the, for the lowest income kids, they're not graduating from high school. That in fact, the majority of the lowest income kids don't come close to graduating from high school. So we decided that we should focus on this third grade. And we said there are three things that's got to happen if we're going to move the needle on third grade reading. We've got to have quality teaching in every setting. And notice how we borrowed the quality teaching in every classroom and stretched it to be quality teaching in every setting for every child every day. That tells me I'm in the room with a lot of early childhood people. <laughs> I know. That's my audience. Because it, by saying quality teaching in every setting every, for every child every day, we acknowledge that the parent is first teacher, and we need quality teaching at home. We need quality teaching for all those who uh, provide care and early education to kids as well. This is not just about quality teaching in the, in, in the classroom. We said the second thing we needed were, and we call it seamless systems of care services and family supports for kids from the prenatal period through, eighth, through the end of third grade. Now, whenever you say the seamless systems of support, we all nod because we know that in most places, and I hear here in Monterey, and in this entire area, you solve this problem. So, th so really, this is not about you. It is about all those places where the health system and the education system and the social services system don't quite speak the same language, don't talk to each other every day, and allow a set of gaps and cracks and crevices through which families and children routinely fall. And everybody thinks they know what we're talking about until we say, well, you know what? When you look at the social sector and the not-for-profit organizations, we do exactly the same thing. We essentially mimic the systems, the public systems that we derive. And we have boys clubs and big brothers and big sisters and YMCA and Healthy Start. And we're not doing anything about talking to each other either. I, I, mean, I know that you've solved this problem here as well. And everybody talks to each other every day. And you've created a seamless system. But for those other folks elsewhere, they're still working on that. And in fact, what we do sometimes is in trying to make this real, we point out that I think it was 1988. And the reason why I say think is you know as you give talks nowadays that there are dozens if not hundreds of smartphones in the audience. So you're being fact-checked even as you're giving the talk. So I think it was 1988 when both U.S. 4x100 teams failed to medal in the Olympics, both the men's and women's, failed to medal. Although it was clear they were the favorites, it's clear they had the, the fastest team, the fastest runners. It was clear that when you look at their performance in the early phases, they did great. What happened? They messed up the passing of the baton. Both failed to medal. And in fact, we use that to say the work that we're doing with young kids, this is more like a relay than it is a sprint. And we have learned to pay a whole lot of attention to results and to outcomes, and virtually no attention to the handoff. And that's why if we look at most communities, we have dozens of organizations that can report really good outcomes. And, and it, the thought occurs to us, if we're all reporting such good outcomes, how does it aggregate up to so little good impact? Because the answer may well be that it's not about the individual outcomes. It is really about the handoff. And if we don't work in the handoff, there's no reason to accept, expect that we'll get any better at what we've got. The third aspect of this work requires us to acknowledge an inconvenient truth. 
And for those of us who work real hard in education reform, the inconvenient truth is there is a large and growing number of kids who are not going to succeed in school, even if we have really good school systems, really good schools, with effective teachers in every classroom equipped with a strong curriculum and supported by a hospitable culture. That's an inconvenient truth. And for many of these kids, they're not going to succeed in school. And you say, how is that possible? There are three groups of kids. One, there are some kids who start out so far behind that they simply cannot catch up in the three years that we have. They cannot catch up. And these kids are behind when they're three. That's not the school's responsibility, that's our response. It's our responsibility to take account of the developmental milestones and make sure kids are born healthy, that they're thriving at three, and they're ready to go at five. And in many communities, we are failing miserably at that task. Secondly, there are some kids who are falling behind during the school year simply because they're missing too much school. In some places, between 10 and 20 percent of the kids are missing more than 10 percent of the school year. In Maryland, 7 percent of the kids miss more than 10 percent of the school year. When we look at the city of Baltimore, 17 percent of the kids miss more than 10 percent of the school year. When we look at East Baltimore, 27 percent of the kids in several schools miss more than 10% of the school year. Well, if you miss 10% of the year in kindergarten and 10% in first grade and 10% in second grade and 10% in third grade, you're almost mathematically eliminated from being on grade level by the time you get to third grade. You know, we can't hold schools responsible and accountable for young kids who are missing that much school. There's something else going on, and whether it's health or family functioning or dislocation or transportation or family mobility, we've got to find out what that is and help parents solve the problems that are keeping the kids from coming to school. Thirdly, is this issue of summer, the summer learning loss of the summer slide. We've known for a century that kids lose ground over the summer. We've known that. Um, and what we know is that summer is a kind of a continuum between risk and opportunity. Um, if I were to, ask, I'd actually have done this, ask people to look at their smartphones and say, where is your kid, your grandkid, your niece, your nephew, your favorite kid going to be on the third Monday or third Tuesday afternoon, around 2 o'clock? third Tuesday afternoon in July. It is now October. And we have people in the room who could answer that question with a great deal of specificity. Because for the kids, and in fact, I was on a panel lately, and one woman just looked around, and she jumped up, raised her hand, and volunteered the information. Look, we know for the kids we care about that summer is about risk and opportunity. And we make sure that, those, that it's more opportunity for our kids than, than it is, that it is risk. If we ask that question in many communities to low-income parents the last day of school in June, and we ask the question, where will that kid be the following Tuesday afternoon, they would, may not have a clue. And what we can bet is that for that kid, what we have is a summer that's more risk and opportunity, and that kid will come back in September at least two months behind where they left the school in June. And so even if a teacher makes a year's progress every year with every kid, unless we do something about summer for low-income kids, at the end of third grade, that kid is going to be two to six months behind. We have got to do better. Uh, about, about, these, about these issues. 
So what we have essentially tried to do in this campaign is focus in on these issues because what we say, we, uh, the first proposition is schools have to do better. We have to accept, expect schools to do better with the kids they have and not the kids they would prefer to have. You know, um, we've got to tell schools it's not as if uh, parents are holding their good kids behind and sending the bad kids to school. The parents are sending schools the best kids they have and sometimes the only kids they have, right? So schools, schools can't wait for the better kids. This is, this is the kids they have. They've got to do better with the kids they have, and we've got to be consistent, insistent, persistent to the point of truculence about that. And this is when the educators in the room uh, go into the kung fu stance or the fetal position, depending upon time of day and temperament. Let me quickly say, I'm not one to beat up on schools because we're going to need a generation of teachers and educators who are a lot tougher, a lot smarter than we are, and we are doing a really bad job of making that seem an attractive profession. We have got to stop beating up on schools. We've got to stop treating this like a spectator sport with us trying to figure out whether we want to be in the, box, in the boxes or the bleachers. We've got to get down out of the boxes and the bleachers, out of the stands, onto the field, off the sidelines, onto the field, and in the game. And what that means is we have got to accept responsibility for those kids who are too far behind, those kids who are losing, falling behind during the school year, and those kids who are losing ground. Now, that message, which we thought would be attractive to 24 communities and 12 states, uh, has resonated across the country. Uh, here in California, where Alicia has overperformed and delivered, instead of nine, delivered, <laughs> delivered 17 uh, communities, that message has resonated. Uh, and we now have 134 communities in 35 states, um, the, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And in some places, when I say uh, we have this, they say, oh, they have to sign up. And the people who had to write those uh, community solutions action plan take great umbrage because they knew that was a much more painful than just signing up. That was a really searching process. We think that Part of that response has been the fact that this whole notion of doing something about uh, third grade reading is a kind of an enabling narrative at a time when what we hear is that we've got to settle for paralysis and gridlock because our politics are broken, partisanship is rampant, and nothing can happen. Local civic leaders and local public officials and local engaged citizens simply say that cannot be true for our community. If there's a problem, we're going to organize to fix it. And that's why so many of you are here today. We think that we, we've seen this progress because we made a quick adjustment. You know, the work that was being done here and the work that Mrs. Panetta spoke so powerfully and eloquently about that's happening here and happened in other places across the country over the couple of, over the last couple of decades. That work which we were joining had been going on and so what we did is we made a slight adjustment to the message, a quick tack. And we tacked into the slipstream of the national consensus around high school graduation. For all the reasons you, ju you, ju you just heard from Dole, you know, there is a growing understanding, not always as eloquently stated, that our nation is going to be better off by a, by a uh, generation of high school graduates who are stronger, um, who are prepared for the world of work, careers, uh, college, who have post-secondary credentials, who can compete in a global economy, uh, ensure national security, and keep the nation at the frontier of technology. 
There's a growing consensus about that. It's among Republicans and Democrats, right and left, red, purple, and green, or red, purple, and blue, and green. Uh, you know, there's really, nobody's arguing about high school, high school graduation. And we tacked into that slip tree and said to all those people who care about high school graduation, you've got to care about grade level reading by third grade because that will predict what happens in terms of high school graduation. And what we tried to do, and what you just saw a really uh, effective presentation, is take a lot of the research, and this is what First Five is doing, and this is what many of you have been doing for a while. You know, take all that research and see if you could translate it into common sense messages that average people can understand and that will yield a sense of urgency. And what we tried to do uh, was to set goals and targets that are ambitious and achievable, but also actionable. And we've seen communities uh, take action. And, you know, when you're at a foundation and you're, you know, you're operating, if not at the 30,000-foot level, you're at 10,000 feet. You know, somebody's got to be doing this work. And the person who's been doing this work in uh, California is Alicia Maldonado, and I'd like Alicia to come forward and tell us a little bit about that work that's happening here in California. Alicia, please. Okay, good morning. And as Ralph indicated, um, I have been working with um, the different communities in California. There are 17 in California. We're hoping to add two more within the next couple months. Um, and so we'll have 19 and possibly 20. Um, and I did want to thank um, Ron Eastwood for his efforts to put this literacy summit together. Um, it's a really good example of the work that is already happening in Monterey County and reflects a lot of the work that is also taking place in some of our other cities. Um, and I'm going to do what I did, I just focus on, get, provide snapshots on five different communities, uh, just a quick overview on some of the things that they're doing. We'll be looking at the different um, solution areas that we're focused on in the campaign, and I'll just provide you with some examples of how they're doing that. Um, the first community is Oakland, and that's not too far from here. Um, and it, they're, I'm focusing with them on coalition building, because they've been really successful, I think, in bringing their stakeholders together. And that work is um, organized by Sanam Giorgiani, and she manages the work of Oakland Reads 2020, and that is actually part of the Oakland Literacy Council. So they have a literacy council that's already doing some work, and then she's part of that council. And Oakland Reads has received strong support from Rogers Family Foundation, who has been with us from the beginning. And some of the key elements that um, Sanam worked to cultivate and strengthen a stakeholder coalition included taking time to learn the landscape, understanding the problem and the players. Identify the existing collaboratives, committees, and initiatives, which needs are being met and which are outstanding. And I would imagine that most of you in this room are actually quite familiar with mobilizing and convening stakeholders and that it's important to convene them early to identify the challenge and the problem and commit to solutions. Now, all of our communities have worked to create a call to action to build the network and to offer a platform to share messages with the broader audience. Like other communities, Oakland has worked to create multiple opportunities for involvement because not everyone will be able or willing to participate in the same way. And the personalities of our communities are as varied as the communities themselves. They're all very different. While they're dealing with the same issues, they have different approaches and they work with the different characteristics of their own communities. These opportunities could be a one-time opportunity, a, a volunteer event. They could be a coalition participant, an outreach advocate, a steering committee member, or even a full-time implementation partner. And there are many different roles that can be played, and it's important for the community members to find their own space, um, and that's right for them, so they can feel compelled and move to action. For Oakland, the early focus on partnerships and coalition building has enabled continuous stakeholder buy-in and investment in the Oakland Reads 2020 campaign. And Sanam will say it's been an invaluable resource in planning, organizing, and mobilizing the Community for Action, which was demonstrated in the Community-Wide Literacy Summit that Oakland also had just this past June. And they also were able to bring out about 250 
um, participants or stakeholders to attend their literacy summit, and they're really making some good progress. And Ralph mentioned the CSAP. Um, they used their summit to help look at their CSAP anew and figure out how they might want to modify it in order to implement the plan. And the next community is um, Fresno County. And the challenge was to ensure that all Fresno County's children are ready for school, ready to learn. And Fresno is the, being led by Mercedes Carmona, and she is the first five Fresno County um, person who works on B3 for Fresno in first five. And the first five has been a really strong partner of the campaign in Fresno. They funded implementation of the Kindergarten Student Interest Profile, or KESAP, in 2012. And some of you might be familiar with that assessment tool because it was um, developed by the University of Santa Barbara, or University of California in Santa Barbara. And KESEP is a research-based observational assessment that is able to predict later greater grade level achievement as measured by the California Standards Test. It's administered by kindergarten teachers during the first six weeks of school to determine a student's social, emotional, and school-ready knowledge. The Fresno County Office of Education, as it mentions here, was chosen as the project lead, and they were um, the ones to submit school data from the district, trainings for the districts, and oversight of subcontractors. In the fall of 2012, four of the largest school districts agreed to use KSEP, and that included Fresno, Central, Sanger, and Clovis. And based on teachers' observations, students are placed in one of the following categories of kindergarten readiness. And at the bottom, it shows ready to go, monitoring, which can be quarterly or mo uh, monthly monitoring, or immediate follow-up. As you can see by the numbers on the slide, between these districts, 10,628 students were assessed in 2012. And they don't have the numbers yet for 2013. They expect to get those in November. But because they're really tracking the kids very well, they know that 80% of Fresno County kindergartners will have been assessed by the time they get their numbers for last year. In Chula Vista, people are probably familiar with Chula Vista, it's just south of San Diego. Um, school leaders in the Chula Vista Elementary School District were working and have been making some gains in the chronic absence area. And one of our national partners that we're working with is Attendance Works. And I don't know if some of you have uh, heard of that. The person is Hetty Chang, and she's based in Oakland. I mean, she's been working with our communities across the country. And she has used um, Chula Vista as a model for the work that can be done to address chronic absence and attendance issues in schools. And I think Matt Ralph mentioned this, but we all know that the kids need to be in the classroom if they're going to benefit from the instruction. And so that's why that's so important. And school officials there are in the process of developing a parent toolkit as a working resource for staff and leaders. Um, these are for the staff and leaders who are working with the parents. It's not for the parents themselves, but it's for the parents, um, for working with the parents. Um, they're also working with another school, though, to try to see if they can get the parents to put together a toolkit for parents to use and figure it would be best and most effective if the parents are actually the ones doing the work. And in addition, principals work with teachers, parents, and students. And strategies include meeting with parents, conducting school attendance review team meetings to counsel students, and then recognizing them when the attendance has approved. The School Attendance Review Board, or SARB, offers support which can include home visits by district staff to address attendance concerns and provide support to the family. The attendance is then monitored by school district staff and parents and students are commended for positive results. And I know that Hetty will often say you really need to recognize the efforts and the, the progress that students and parents are making. If improvement doesn't occur, the next step would be legal consequences, such as referral to juvenile court. But Chula Vista has been really good at making sure their students don't get to that step. And there are many creative efforts in place to support families. One thing that happened to them recently is that Promise Neighborhoods was, reward, was awarded to an organization serving a school in the district. And the district is now looking at that particular school as a demonstration site to continue to develop the best practices and then be able to replicate those out to other districts. In the San Diego Office of Education, um, this, they actually were trying to be very proactive and trying to work with the legal um, agencies. And so they approached the district attorney to create a district attorney mediation program. And that is now expanded to include other districts for in 2013-2014. And so aside from the figures that you see here on the slide, in 2012-2013, the district had an enrollment of 26,938 students with 118 referrals that were sent to the School Attendance Review Board. Of these cases, 50 were moved on to attend a SARB hearing. 
of those 50 cases, four were scheduled for a district attorney mediation. And so again, Chula Vista is working really hard to make sure the kids do not get into the legal system. They try to address the attendance issue before it gets to that point, and I think they're being pretty effective. In Sacramento, uh, for many schools and youth serving organizations, the summer presents unique challenges. And this was looking at trying to provide summer programs and providers with the needed resources, support, and networking opportunities to best address summer learning loss and the needs of at-risk youth. Programs and providers find themselves isolated with few resources, little support, and little connection to others who share their concerns on how to best address the challenges of summer learning loss and the needs of at-risk youth. In response to this, the U.S. Center, Davis Center for Community School Partnerships, Sarah Health Foundation, the Packard Foundation, and a host of committed community partners collaborated to develop the Regional Summer Matters Sacramento campaign. And we have a lot of, um, Sacramento has probably 30 to 40 different partners that they are working with um, on a regular basis on the campaign. And this campaign provided technical assistance, support, leadership, and qualitative research to make summer learning a signature of the educational reform process throughout the Sacramento region. So they really are trying to do it Sacramento-wide. They're working with a number of school districts in the, re in the region. The campaign, campaign also worked with another one of our national partners, the National Summer Learning Association, in this project. And these efforts continue to improve the summer to school pipeline, increases the number of high quality programs, which in the end means that more children will have access to summer learning programs. And they minimally will see reading levels maintained during the summer months. As you can see here, 60% of the students maintain the reading level, 20% increased reading levels by one grade, and 20% increased reading levels by two grades. And the final example is Los Angeles. And this has to do with parent engagement. And we really support and feel that parent engagement is extremely important in the campaign. There's an annual summer learning initiative that's sponsored by the families and schools. And it's, they try to engage parents in the education of their kids at every level of education. And that even goes up to post-secondary education. And one of my favorite programs that they have is the Passport to Success. Um, and Passport to Success encourages families of LUSD students to attend uh, museums and libraries throughout the summer months. They have, um, they're actually working with 37 museums and 73 libraries. And the really exciting thing about this is that it exposes children to museums and to uh, artwork and just different things that some of the kids have never been exposed to before. And students receive prizes for turning in their stamped passports at school in September. But I think the biggest prize of all, perhaps, is like the smile of satisfaction and the feeling of accomplishment that both the child and the parent has when they go through the program. And Families and Schools has a video that they produced for one of their museum visits. And I may be a softie, but it really brought tears to my eyes because uh, there was this one little boy who was probably eight or nine, and he had never been to a museum before. And the excitement on his face and just the pleasure that he had looking at the artwork on the walls and being involved and talking to his mom, and they were totally engaged. They, they videotaped the entire uh, visit, and it was only like a three-minute video, but it was just a wonderful example of the kind of positive work that can happen. And the impact of this program, you see 40,000 LUSD students and families were reached this summer. Um, they also work with 69 schools. And as you can see, the positive reaction from the parents who reported that their child was prepared to start school in the fall and that their child shows more interest in learning, and they say that it really was because of Passport to Success. And then I just wanted to just give a couple of things that we're doing um, with the different communities in California. And we began doing some peer consultancy calls because the communities themselves felt like they wanted to share best practices and model programs and this ideas with each other. And so we began to do some bi-monthly conference calls with the communities. And they determine what the issues will be. And um, we try to also engage the different leads in the different communities to be part of those phone calls and to help share and, and kind of guide the conversation. We also have calls that provide information on current policy issues, such as the local control funding formula. And I think most people in this room are probably at least somewhat aware of that and how it might affect the funding of schools in the future when it's implemented next year. That was one issue that we're going to be covering in a November um, conference call. We also have an email distribution list and a directory of contacts for all the different community members that we work with. And that's available to them so that they can connect with each other whenever they need to or want to. And then I just had a message from the different communities that are part of our campaign network. 
And they really are hoping that you'll decide to join our efforts in the campaign to help you know, kids reach grade level reading proficiency by the end of third grade. So thank you. You know, when you have a campaign, uh, people say, okay, you have a campaign, what's the win? Uh, here's how we describe the win campaign, the, the wins from a standpoint of the broader campaign. Uh, we say that we've got to see broad-based support for and real investment in on track child development, learning, and literacy across the early years and early grades. This is both the support and investment. We've got to see widespread community action, community engagement, I'm sorry, civic action and citizen service to find and to implement community solutions to the barriers to student success. And we want to see state and local and federal policy reforms that would strengthen, scale, and sustain improved child incomes and school success for kids in low-income families. What the first win translates into, we believe in many local communities, could be something like fewer children showing up to school with undetected, undiagnosed, physical ailments, health impairments, developmental delays, and social and emotional challenges. Kindergarten and first grade teachers should not be essentially at the front line. We've got to figure that out, and we're, and we're hoping that you would see communities across the country that would choose not to make uh, teachers the first responders. We think that when we talk about community engagement and civic action, the wonderful work of volunteers should be expanded, but making sure that volunteers are trained and managed in such a way that we can get all of what they have to offer without overly burdening the schools and adding a significant management responsibility. And some communities are doing a fabulous uh, job of that. And we've seen policy reforms in many forms and shape. And here in California, the first, first five is leading the, the way. And we're really committed to being as supportive as we can uh, with first five. What we've learned from looking at this work and doing this work across the country, you know, you try to summarize it, and there's a whole lot and trying to get it on one slide in four points uh, is, is a bit of a challenge. But here's, if you say, what's the advice? It's a both-and strategy, whether you're an investor or promoter of engagement, civic action, or advocacy. One, we've got to avoid the either-or mentality, because when we say focus, it sometimes drives us to either-or. And we've got to embrace a both-and. We've got to focus both on the early years and on the early grades. Because if we don't do that, we continue this siloing uh, that is so prevalent in this area where sometimes P means prenatal and other times it means pre-K. Uh, you know, between the first eight years, we've got people who care about infants, people who care about to toddlers, people who care about the first three years, the second three years. Yeah. We've got, to, we've got to get over ourselves and do better than that and focus on both the early years and the early grades. We've got to focus on children and on the adults in their lives. I know that the adults are not as warm and cuddly, they're not as fuzzy, they're not as sweet, they're not as innocent, but we've, you know, we've got to focus on those adults and sometimes those adults are parents Sometimes they're caregivers, sometimes they're providers, and sometimes uh, they're teachers. And we've got to make sure that all adults who touch the lives of kids 
have the resources and the supports to do better. Uh, we've got to avoid the false distinction between uh, literacy and STEM. We've got to do, we've got to do both. And as I said earlier, we have got to commit to finding a way, not just to focus on improving outcomes, but, in, but to focus on making sure that we have that warm handoff, which is at the core of the continuity of care services and family supports that will make a difference for kids. It's inspiring to see you all here today. Uh, this is what the campaign hopes to be associated with in communities such as yours. We're delighted. Thank you very much for having us.